How much do I pay per month for my Tesla? This includes car note and by extension what I paid, put down, rate, and term to get said car note, my insurance cost, maintenance, and how much my electric bill has gone up by otherwise known as charging costs. Cost per month is always a big question, and if you're looking at buying a Tesla, it's probably something you're very much interested in. And make sure you watch to the end as I'll be comparing how much I pay versus how much I make to give a better understanding of my situation in hopes of making your decision more straightforward. Also, thank you to Fantech for sponsoring this video, but more on them later. So if you're new to the channel, Welcome, I have a 2022 Model 3 Performance that I purchased new from Tesla in August of 2022. Now, if buying a Tesla has just recently come on your radar, please note that the price I'm about to mention is a whole lot more than what you'd pay now. There was a 12-ish month period there around the end of 2021 to the end of 2022 where pretty much across the board, all Teslas were about 30 plus percent higher than what they are now. A base Model 3 performance at the time was 62,990. From there, I added the black and white interior for an extra thousand and black paint for an extra 1,500. If I could go back and redo it, I probably wouldn't get the paint. I would just get whatever the free color was and then wrap it, but I would definitely get the white seats again. I, I love my white seats. But this brought the total to 65490 Then throw on the $1,200 destination fee, $250 order fee, and the $4 tire fee for a grand total of $66,900. And $44. Now, my state does charge sales tax, so this doesn't include sales tax, but that's just because I didn't roll it into the loan. I just paid it all up front once I bought the car back to my state because of like dealership laws. I couldn't purchase it directly in my state. But for those curious, it was around like 3000 Now, while 66000 for a Model 3 in today's world is kind of insane, honestly, it was kind of insane back then, but the justification was price to performance, I did just come off of selling my Model 3 long range which I had had for almost a year, had put almost 10,000 miles on for 10,000 over what I had paid for it. So yes, I paid an inflated price, but I sold for an inflated price. So it kind of evens out, or at least that's what I tell myself to help me sleep a little bit better. But now let's talk car note because I did take out a loan. I placed my order in early June and was told I should have the car by the end of June to the beginning of July. And because most car loan approvals are valid for around 30 days or so, I started shopping around at the third to fourth week of June. Another reason for me shopping around at this time was because the Fed had a meeting coming up and they had been raising rates all year. So I was hoping to lock in a decent rate. I knew I wasn't gonna get the 2% that I had on my long range, but I was hopeful that it would still be somewhat decent. I ended up getting approvals from three different credit unions, and I got approved for a 3.29, a 3.49, and a 3.79, all at 72 months. One of them also offered a 2.99 at 60 months. I don't remember what the other ones offered at 60 months. I only remember that one because it was my only sub 3% that I got. However, the car didn't come in July. So all the approvals expired and the Fed raised the rates. By the time the car was ready, my two best offers were a 3.99 at 60 months or a 4.29 at 72 months. I ended up taking the 72 month simply because it was about 70-ish dollars less on the month. Some people will say that if you need 72 months to pay the car off, then you can't afford the car. And well, I would disagree. In my opinion, if you need over 48 months, then you can't afford the car. However, if you're planning on paying it off early, then there's nothing wrong with taking out those longer terms, assuming there isn't a huge discrepancy in rates, to lessen your monthly burden in the event of an emergency. Or if you're able to allocate that money to something else that's gonna outpace whatever rate you're paying. Which, when I first purchased the car, I aligned with reason one, lower monthly payment in case of emergency with the plan of paying it off early. But as the Fed kept raising rates, it became increasingly easier to outpace my rate at a very low risk. In fact, I have a high yield savings account right now that's actually at a five and a half percent APY. So it's more than a percent outpacing what I'm paying for my car. I'll actually have that high yield savings account linked down below in case you're interested. During that first year, I was paying every like two to three weeks and was on track to pay my car off in the 36 to 48 
month range. But then of course I transitioned to just putting my money elsewhere. So that's why I technically don't owe a car payment to like the middle of next year. And then to add on top of that, I am planning on purchasing the Model 3 Ludicrous whenever that becomes available and selling my current Model 3 performance. But yeah, my car note is $658 and I believe 18 cents per month on a $41,694 loan. Meaning I put $25,250 down, the $250 coming from the order fee, which normally I would not put over 30% down, but considering I had just made an extra 10 k for my long range, I figured why not. And I'm not going to lie, I thought putting that amount down would mean I'd never be close to being upside down or underwater, but of course, my luck, that's just, that's just not the case. I'm still not upside down, but I'm a lot closer than I ever thought I would be. I think I owe like 20 on the car and most offers I'm getting right now are like 30 to like 32. Now, something that I don't need to worry about turning upside down, this new screwdriver workstation from Fantech. No, seriously, like all the bits are magnetized and it even has spots to keep screws and other tiny metal pieces you're working with magnetized in place. You probably know Fantech from their tire inflator and car accessories, but they've recently had some new best sellers from their electric screwdrivers. And today I've got their newest addition, the E1 NEX workstation. It's a fully functional foldable workstation that includes 64 precision drill bits, all made of nickel plated S2 steel, which means Means they're oxidation and corrosion resistant. 12 tools such as an opening pick, anti-static strap, spudger, angle tweezer, suction handle, and more, while still having a compartment to slot the screwdriver into, which, by the way, can screw something like 400 screws in on a single charge charges via USB-C, has a 0.05 and 0.2 newton meter automatic mode, along with a manual mode for up to three newton meters. And the screwdriver also incorporates a flashlight right next to the tip where all the bits magnetized to. The E1 NEX workstation is a fantastic little kit for small electronic device DIYs or just random things around the house, like fixing your kids a switch instead of paying Nintendo's outrageous repair prices, phone repairs, glasses, I even used it to fix my box cutter. Plus, it's on a pretty big sale right now. If you use my link down in the description, you'll be taken over to Amazon where you'll be able to apply a $15 off coupon. Then, until the end of March, you can use code WORKSTATION, all caps, to save an additional 10%. This is a great little workstation and I guarantee you'll never be asking yourself if you have a bit for that ever again. Now the next monthly expense is insurance, which I did recently discuss, so I will keep this short, plus it's insurance and it can vary widely on a ton of different factors. Like even if you have the same stats as me, you could pay something completely different. I currently pay about $1,000 for a six month premium at a 250, 500, 250. Every six months, I shop around to try and get a better rate. I've had premiums as low as 800 and as high as 1200, but on average, it's around about $1,000 or $166 per month. I'll have a list on screen here of all the insurance companies that I look through whenever I'm up for renewal to see if they can give me a better price. Insurance, as most of you all probably know though, has been going kind of crazy lately. And from what I've heard, it's not gonna slow down. So I expect the average for my insurance to kind of slowly continue creeping up over the next few years. Now, what about maintenance? Because a lot of people do calculate that into their monthly car costs like they should. But to be honest with you, I don't really do that. I have almost 20,000 miles on my car and have not done any maintenance whatsoever except wheel swaps slash rotations, but I do all that myself at home. These cars just don't really have maintenance. Like you gotta swap the air cabin filter like every two years and lube up your brake calipers every now and then. But besides that, it's not really that much. I actually recently did a video on hidden costs of owning a Tesla where I go over all of Tesla's like recommended maintenance straight from the manual and on average how much they cost. And a lot of them are things that you do at like two years or four years or even six years. So, I mean, I guess you could take the amount that you're gonna pay at like the six year mark and then divide it by all those many months and then you could tack it on to your monthly cost. But 
I really just don't do that. It's just pennies on the dollar compared to ICE vehicle maintenance, where the monthly cost actually adds a non-insignificant amount. And then finally, my electric bill or charging costs. Unless I am road tripping that month, which I only do a few times a year, then my charging costs are zero for like superchargers and public charging. I do 99.9999 repeating of my charging at home, where I am on an on slash off peak plan, and during those off peak hours, I pay six cents per kilowatt hour. And of course, I don't charge during on peak. Taking a look at Teslify, which tracks all my car stats, and I'll have them linked down below. I'm not sponsored or anything. I've just been using them forever. I used exactly 393 kilowatt hours for the month of February, which is on the higher end of my average, but I'd rather give an overestimation on the average than an underestimation. At six cents per kilowatt hour, that's about $23.00 in 50 cents. So 20 to let's just say $30 extra on the month for my electric bill. And I drove a thousand miles last month. So a thousand miles at $23 and 50 cents, that's about two cents per mile. Adding my car note plus insurance plus charging costs, that puts me at right around about $850. Then add another 50-ish dollars per month for my registration, motor vehicle property tax, and my state's new EV tax. And you're looking at around $900 per month after everything is said and done. Now, I did say I would compare how much I'm paying versus my income. And without getting too into the details, it's around 5% of my monthly income, which I'm not gonna lie, is more on the extreme side. What a lot of people recommend and a good rule of thumb is you can go up to about 10% of your monthly income. But if you're really into cars and you're not spending like a crazy percent on your mortgage or your rent, then you could push it up to 20%. I used to be one of those people that thought that you had to drive a beater, pay all cash, and it shouldn't exceed more than like one tenth of your annual like salary. But to be honest with you, I just don't agree with that anymore for a lot of reasons. Most people that tell you to live like that don't, or if they are, then it's not by choice. The safety of those older beaters is nowhere near what the modern cars provide. And just above all, it's it's boring. It's, it's very, very boring. Like if it brings you joy, how much is joy worth? You know, I still enjoy driving my car so much. Like every time I get in it, I still enjoy driving it. You live one life. Why not have a little bit of fun? Now, as for what I plan on doing whenever Tesla comes out with the Model 3 Ludacris, well, it entirely depends on rates. If I can't get a good rate, then I'll either do all cash or like half up front and pay off the other half after like a year. If I can, then I'll probably repeat what I'm doing now. By that, I mean like taking out a full length loan because there's a lot of low risk options right now to park money with good returns. One of my local credit unions right now is actually offering like a sub 4%, which in today's climate is actually pretty good. This was a bit of a different video, so if you did enjoy it, then let me know by leaving a like. That way I know that I can make more stuff like this in the future. If you feel comfortable sharing, then comment how much per month you're spending on your Tesla or how much you're looking to spend. I bet 2023 and four purchases have really brought the average down of like how much people spend per month compared to like 21 and 22 purchasers. If you're new around here and you want to see more Tesla related stuff in your YouTube feed, then feel free to subscribe and I will see you all in the next one. Peace.